What's up, YouTubers? So today, I thought we would take a break from my MIG welding and answer a viewer submission, viewer request. And I'll put up his post right now. And I think this is a pretty involved subject that I would love to talk about. And since it affects MIG, TIG, stick, what a great time to do it. We're in the middle of MIG welding, but that's all right. It affects all processes pretty much equally. And it's great, valuable knowledge that I have to share on this. So grab a beer or some popcorn, whatever, and let's dive into this. So speaking of beer, this stuff, ginger beer, non-alcoholic, Bundaberg, I don't know how to pronounce that's probably close. Not bad stuff. If you have a ginger beer you like, leave it in the comments, let me know. Pretty good. So anyways, today's topic is basically the difference between tensile strength weld penetration and kind of that whole ballpark of that which it can be pretty freaking confusing i i know but this is all great information because it'll help you make better decisions when it comes to your welding as well as making stuff so we're going to dive into engineering and welding and all sorts of stuff and there's going to be a lot of book learning so you know put your reading glasses on <laughs> no so my viewer's question, right off the bat, I can tell that he's a little bit confused about the difference between mechanical strength and test result strength of a filler material. And I'll give you a great example. I got a bunch of welds here from my previous video on MIG welding. If you have a weld, like say both of these, or actually let's give an be even better example here. You look at how cold this weld is here, okay? It's a bead of caulk, it's barely tied in, right? Is this weld as strong as this weld? The answer is no. Say the whole plate was done with this poorly fused in weld and this plate all nicely fused hot. If you were to bend these, guess which one would fail? Obviously this one would fail first. Why is that? Well, because there's no penetration, and because of that, there's no mechanical strength to the joint. Now, both of these were welded with the same filler that are 70,000 tensile strength, MIG filler, ER70, S6, or S2. I don't even know what I have, but 70,000 PSI tensile strength. So this is a great example of the wire's specification having little to do with the actual mechanical strength. So what we need to cover first is what tensile strength is, and then we're gonna get into mechanical strength uh, in a bit. So I got this paper here just kind of as a background to help us. So tensile strength is essentially how much strength is required, or in it's rated in PSI, pounds per square inch, you guys overseas, uh, or aka the rest of the world from America might rate it in something else like Newton meters or something. I don't know. We're going to talk about PSI, but you guys get the idea. So they take a specimen and then they pull it and record what force it takes to pull it apart. So the highest peak until failure. So whatever point from when it's normal like this socket till you pull this until it fails the highest reading that's tensile strength now in the case of most mig wire like what i use for all of these the tensile strength is around seventy thousand is what the wire is spec for and i'll actually put up a spec for a common er70 s6 wire right now so here's a spec sheet from washington alloys for er70 s6 mig wire we're going to concern ourselves with the bottom where it gives our actual test results. So let's look at that. So here we have a bunch of specifications. Now, if you see, it says AWS spec. That means that that is a minimum spec or in some cases a maximum spec that's allowed. Some of them, as you see at the bottom, say not available or doesn't apply, that's because there is no specification under those. Now some wires for certain jobs will have those specifications as well as possibly a lot more specifications than what you see here. 
because this wire is meant to weld mild steel. You simply don't have massive amounts of properties that have to be tested. So when you look at the tensile strength, you can see that the specification is actually far lower than what it tests at. Now this does not depict it, but there's actually a minimum tensile strength, which in this case is 70,000, and typically there's a maximum, so a ceiling level that you can exceed. Now I'll be actually breaking down what most of these are actually referring to later in the video. I just wanted to get you guys familiar with looking at a spec sheet for a particular wire. And keep in mind, this is just of the filler material. When you actually weld something, you're creating an alloy of both this material and the base material. So these test results do not apply to something you weld, only to what you're making the weld with, if that makes sense. And if you want to see more of these, basically just go on any uh, Washington Alloy site, Lincoln Electric site, any company that sells wire and they generally will have spec sheets for the products that are available for you to buy and you can look at all of them they're pretty simply laid out which is good they, they tend not to be too confusing it's just if you don't know what you're looking at obviously <laughs> how are you going to figure it out but that's the point of this video so let's move on so you saw that the specification is one thing and test results are another like I had said in that, the test results, there's a window of what's deemed acceptable, okay? It's not just it has to be exactly this or it's no good. There's plus or minus a little bit, okay? Typically more or less plus because <laughs> you wouldn't want to sell 70,000 PSI wire and it actually performs at 60. It can be over, generally not under. So that's a minimum specification in that case. Now... To get that with a welding consumable, like say your ER70S6 wire or your 7018, they take an alloy of that filler material in a cylinder kind of like this. It's going to be likely smaller than this, and it's a very precise diameter, and it's a very precise length. The reason is, is that they put it in an apparatus, a high-precision press of sorts, and it functions more as like pulling than pressing, but with a known consistent measurable accurate diameter and length, they can pull a specimen and record the ultimate tensile strength, and then they can compare it to another filler materials alloy the same size, and they can determine if it's less or more. They get accurate, repeatable results. So when you have an ER70S6 MIG wire, that means at a minimum it took 70,000 pounds to pull it apart. A 6013 rod means that it took 60,000 PSI to pull it apart. So that's what they're referring to. Not just filler material has a strength rating, but steel has a strength rating. So this mild steel, which this was hot rolled mild steel, has specifications for tensile strength, and I'll put those up now and we can talk about it. So this is a spec sheet for A36 mild steel. This is hot rolled steel. This is very common. Any big box store that you buy steel at or your steel mill, this is what they sell. When we look at the ultimate tensile strength, you can see that the PSI is kind of all over the place. I mean, 58,000, almost 80,000. What you buy could be 58,000 or could be 79,800. It could also be slightly higher than that typically. It all depends on where you're getting it from and whether or not they tested what they're producing and if they care if it's in spec or not. Now the interesting thing is if you recall the ER70S6 MIG wire tests at 80,000 roughly, at least that one did, well if you had 58,000 tensile strength steel, your MIG wire or TIG wire, whatever you're welding with, or your welding rod, would actually have higher strength than the base material. And that's why, like, if you weld with a 6013 rod, you may actually not be below the strength, the ultimate tensile strength of the material. It's entirely possible because the 6013 rod probably tests closer to 66,000 for tensile strength. 
But that's a whole nother rabbit hole that we're not going to go down at this point. Now the interesting thing here is if you look at the yield tensile strength, and I'll cover later in this video what they're referring to, the yield point is 36,000. In simple terms, that's when the material starts to stretch and gain length. That's very low. If you recall, the yield strength on that MIG wire was nowhere near that low. What it means is that your weld with standard MIG wire is going to be actually far stronger and it's going to stretch at a lot higher of a strength than the base material. So just based on this information, I can tell you that A36 is a very ductile and flexible material, which is good because it, when you get into very strong, hard materials, they tend to be very brittle, and rather than bending, they just break without warning. So that's all interesting stuff, but let's keep moving on to where we can cover more of this stuff in depth. So you saw that the specifications for this is different than the filler material. The reality is, is that we as home welders and hobbyists, we often over weld stuff. And what I mean by that is we use alloys of filler that are higher than the strength of what we're welding. And the primary reason for that is that you're better off being a little pinch too strong than you are not strong enough. And you have to remember as well is that your filler material, your rod, your wire that melts into this, like any of these welds here, you have created an alloy that is no longer your filler material and it's no longer the base material. This weld here is a combination of the two. So if you were to cut this weld out and test it, it would essentially have differing properties from both the base material and your filler. So that's also taken into account where if you're slightly two, 3% to even 10% stronger on your tensile strength, then you are the base material by time it all blends together you're going to be about the same, okay, due to the dilution. But with that said, the question is, is that at what point is tensile strength too much? Well, there are rods out there like 11018 uh, or even MIG wire that would be up in that ballpark. Same thing with TIG wire. And you can get tensile strengths like some of the stainlesses that are commonly available are absurdly high. Tensile strength is one thing. Another thing that's tested for on any kind of alloy for filler is what's known as elongation. So your specimen as you're pulling it, elongation is the measure of how much the material actually stretches before it fails. And they go from a starting measurement to a finishing measurement. So basically either right as it fails or after they recombine it and get an approximation. It all depends on the test. Now, generally it's given as a percentage, not as a measurement. So like, hey, the elongation was a half inch. Well, it's like, well, half inch and what? 10 inches long or one inch long? Because that's a completely different percentage. So they generally give a percentage. Common uh, MIG wire, you know, 15 to 25% elongation, that's quite a bit of stretch from basically starting to failure. And elongation is very important because it gives you something to predict the performance of the filler material. And I'll give you a great example of why that would matter. Say you're welding on a bridge or a semi-frame that requires flexibility. If you have a material that has very low elongation where it basically stretches, say, 2%, what will happen is, is that you will have failure and you won't have any warning. Like, you won't be able to take measurements to determine how close something is to failure because it's either together or it's broken. And you don't want that. That's why, like, with mild steel like this stuff, you can stretch this quite a bit and it won't fail which is a good thing because having that given there, you'll be able to see evidence something isn't right before you have catastrophic failure. The other thing that's interesting is elongation. If you have a material that has low elongation, typically it's also very hard. 
So a great example of that would be um, hard facing rods for stick and for MIG wire. Hard facing is incredibly strong, so super high tensile strength. Its elongation is going to be very minimal, and that is not a filler material that you want to use to weld something like mild, mild steel. Under stress, yeah, it's incredibly strong, but it's also incredibly brittle, and it will crack. Again, it's going to take a tremendous amount of force to, but it will crack. And sometimes uh, the brittleness of the material becomes a role as well. Like it's something that's very, very low in elongation. It's probably very brittle. So it might take a tremendous amount of strength to flex it, and it's strong in that way, but on something, say like a concrete jackhammer for a skid steer, if it's brittle and it doesn't take impact force very well, what will happen is even though it was plenty strong for what you were doing, the shaking, the, the, the lack of ductility and basically how brittle it is, it leads it to failure, if that all makes sense, hopefully. So elongation does play a role. Again, for us home gamers, we're not going to be seeing too many failures by using the wrong filler material because we're not welding stuff for NASA, we're not welding bridges, and we're probably not welding truck frames, okay? And by truck frames, I mean the more modern, high-strength steel stuff. But again, this is very pertinent, important information because if you don't understand these things, you may accidentally weld a material with the wrong filler, and guess what? You will have undesirable side effects, aka failures. So let's talk about yield strength. So yield strength is essentially when you're putting that specimen under stress and you're pulling it, at what point does it start to lengthen? So a yield strength, say of a typical, I'll just throw out numbers. A flux core wire's yield strength is 55,000 PSI, ultimate tensile strength is 90,000. What that tells you is that at 55,000 PSI on that specimen, it's starting to give, it's starting to stretch, it's starting to turn to kind of like plastic, okay? And then it still continues on and the pressure keeps rising, 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 and boom, it snaps, at ultimately at a much higher number. The yield strength becomes important because if you have a material or a filler that has very low yield strength, what that means is, is that it's going to be very flexible and it's going to end up stretching. But if you want something that resists that, like it has to be strong, you don't want something flexible, that would be a problem. Like if you look at like a spring steel for a truck leaf spring, very flexible and it, you know, returns back to its original shape. That's memory. That's an awesome feature for a truck spring. But if you need something for a lathe, for like a tool holder, do you want something that's flexible like that, where when you put a cutter in and it's just moving all over? No, you want something rigid. So again, the proper material for what you're doing. There's all sorts of alloys for that specific purpose, if that makes sense. Now, what you will find is materials that have very high tensile strength, it's somewhat common for them to have a yield strength that is closer to the tensile strength and their elongation is more limited. So essentially, like it has very, like that hard face rod I was telling you about, that alloy is going to pull, 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 pull. There's not very much movement, you know, 5% on it, elongation, and boom, it snaps. And it's more or less brittle, very strong, but brittle. Again, undesirable for certain instances. Now, it also goes without saying that you can create an alloy yourself as a welder that performs much undesirable like that. And a great example of that would be if you weld cast iron with, say, ER70 MIG wire, high carbon cast, what ends up happening is your weld is now a mixture of the base material and your filler material. Well, that carbon will leach out of the cast into the molten pool and then will basically create a high carbon weld that's extremely strong, very low ductility, very brittle. And now when you stress that part, 
it's going to break and fail. And again, often without warning. And that's clearly undesirable because as home gamers, as builders, we rather see evidence or have something hang on quite a bit and bend before it fails. Like in my experience, when you deal with super high strength materials, a lot of it, you rather have some warning that something's going to happen rather than just bam, it fails. Like a great example would be a hook, a forged hook on a crane. I rather see that hook starting to, you know, kind of bend open a little bit to where I can say, holy shit, take, you know, 1,500 pounds off that load, you idiot. I'd rather have that happen than, oh, it looks fine, and then boom, drops, you know, 40,000 pounds on the ground. So, you know, generally speaking, we want to have more ductility and better elongation in, you know, <laughs> I guess in a way lower yield strength, but again, it all depends on the alloy. Hopefully those things make sense. We're now going to move into talking about mechanical versus actual like alloy testing. So when it comes to mechanical strength, and I'll find something here that will kind of prove my point. Here we go. So when you look at this, you see how cold and pretty much shitty that weld looks and it's barely tied in. I mean, maybe to you it doesn't look that bad, but trust me, if this whole plate was welded like that, I could probably take it with my hands and break it. Undesirable. Versus when you look at a weld like, I don't know, a bunch of these are pretty good. Like even this guy, a little big, but seems to have been run hotter, it's flatter. A good example would be, let's see here. Yeah, like this guy. Definitely wetted in there good, okay? Mechanical strength and the alloy, the tensile strength, are completely different references. The ultimate strength of the alloy of like that MIG gun over there is wire. That test result is of that wire. That's not a test result of what you're welding. This is totally different tensile strength and specifications. And it's not a rating of your weld. A great example would be this weld right here. Of course, I get them mixed up. This little weak weld here, looking at this, will this hold as much weight as this weld? No. Yet both of these were welded with the same wire. Well, how could that be? Well, that's because the weld here, that's a mechanical strength issue, not a tensile strength. And that's why as a skilled welder, a skilled welder can make far stronger welds than an inexperienced novice welder. And that's because they can get things like root fusion, properly sized welds, etc. So the strongest wire, like we could weld this with hard face and it's not going to be strong unless it's tied in, if, if it makes sense to you. So what my viewer was talking about, I think, is just a misunderstanding of really what makes strong welds. And strong welds are welds that are properly fused, properly sized, and of the alloy that fits for the material that you're welding. Now, if we were to say this was ultra high strength steel and we welded it with 6013, okay, at 60,000 psi tensile strength, is that a strong weld? The answer is no. That is the weld is weaker than the base material. Now, if we were to take hard face rod and weld this base material with it, is that a strong weld? Well, it might outperform 6013, keyword might, but it might be so brittle that when you bend it, it just breaks before you put any real load on it because it's that brittle. So in that case, no, that isn't a strong weld. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us that the pro again, the proper material, base material matched with the proper filler, welded competently, meaning proper fusion, wetted in toes, thickness of the weld, the height of the weld, all of that is within reason to the thickness of the base material. That is the ideal weld. So that's a whole lot of garbage, but let's actually look at what I'm talking about. So I'll draw us a little picture here if I can. 
should have just drew, <laughs> drew it out by hand, it would have been faster. So here's a fillet weld, and this is going to be our example. If I put down a weld that's about this thickness, okay, is the distance from this root here, we'll call this little section the root right there, to the face of the weld appropriate for this thickness material. Again, this is, you'd be welding some pretty giant plates here with an absolute ginormous weld here, but is it appropriate? I would say, yes, the thickness distance here is actually about the thickness of the material, if you use that as a measure. So that's very good. Now it's a little bit higher up here than it is here, but that is a slight inconsistency and a weld defect. Okay, too much reinforcement up here, too little down here. Whatever, we'll, we'll overlook that. This is appropriate. Now, if your weld is literally just sitting here and your penetration looks like this, is this a strong weld? The answer is no. Is it an acceptable weld? Well, it depends on what this is for. And we'll get into that in a second. Let's talk about why this is or isn't strong. This is not strong because essentially this point right here, as you stress this plate back and forth, it will leverage, because nothing is attached here, it will leverage off of this weld and essentially off of this point right here. So as you take this and you bend that, and here I'll do it this way so it's less confusing. As you take and leverage it, you can see how essentially this part of your weld is getting pulled this way and then this is trying to come this way. This is not a strong situation. Now this could be acceptable if both sides were welded and you had poor fusion, it really wouldn't matter that much because this plate can't lift here, okay? It may not matter if it's a non-critical part that's never going to see that much, I guess, stress. If you had another, if this came over here, down here, and it was welded over here to where this is kind of like a U per se, and you had poor fusion here, but this is solid, will it matter? Probably not. It all depends on the circumstances. Like there's simply too many variables to say whether or not this would be acceptable or not. We as home gamers need to worry about just making a weld what it should be, which is properly penetrated, proper size. So ideally for us, we would like to see on a cut and etch our weld to look something like this, where our weld, you can see on a cut and etch, clear evidence of penetration into the bottom plate and into the top plate, and then past the actual intersection, the root of the joint. Now this weld nugget is typical of what you'd see a 6013 or 7018 weld. They tend to look like this. When you get into 6010, those tend to look more like this, where you have a really deep driving penetration down in here. Uh, spray arc MIG tends to look like this. Flux core tends to look like this. Short circuit MIG tends to be, especially on thicker plates, the one that you don't see any root fusion. And that has a lot to do with the operator, but Short circuit MIG probably has the least fusion, root penetration, etc., of any process, so something to be aware of. Now, by getting fusion past here, we now have to leverage, if this is coming this way, you now have to leverage off of here, but with this section fused together, it's going to be that little bit is going to be a lot harder because to get movement, you're going to have to tear through that fusion up to here to get movement on that. That little bit of fusion will add a lot of mechanical strength to this. Again, is it needed? Well, in my opinion, as home gamers, it's a benefit and we should be looking for it because absent of it, 
what you're making is going to be weaker. Whether or not it's weak enough to matter depends on what you're welding. Now, with really thin material, it's very common, like say 16th inch, to get full fusion where you will literally melt through the whole material all the way through it. On thicker material, like this eighth inch, and I'll show you where I ran really hot on one of these, and it barely, so this, I just sat here just pumping wire in, and you can see I barely got through, I mean, again, this is short arc MIG, spray arc would melt right through there, or 6010 would melt right through there, okay? So the process you're welding with, the penetration differs. Is it desirable to have all the way pass through penetration? Well, it really depends. If you're not gonna weld the backside, it would be a benefit because having this all fused, so say this weld nugget looks something like this. Okay, that would be somewhat desirable because again, how, look at the strength you have here. This, rather than just pulling this way, now has to pull up this way and forward here. Think of the amount of strength that would require over just pulling it up here. So yes, this is stronger. Again, is it needed? Depends on what you're welding. The issue with full penetration like this is it's very difficult to achieve, a virtually impossible on thicker material. You're just not going to, uh, without running a bevel and a gap, the gap will help. And not only that, if you try and aim for full penetration on everything, you're running on the ragged edge, depending on thickness, of blowing a hole, putting excessive heat into something, etc. So there are downsides to trying to get full penetration on everything. And in a lot of cases, it's simply not needed. On fillet welds, to get maximum strength, you know, realistically, depending on what it is, you may not need even half of the penetration to get to the maximum strength because it's the engineering, the design of what you're welding that will give it the strength more so than the welds. The welds may just be holding certain things together so they don't move, but the actual strength comes from the design of it. So it's just all these things are something to consider. So let's move on. So where does all this stuff leave us? In well, it's a ton of information. I'm sure that you didn't retain a lot of it, and don't worry, that's not your fault. <laughs> we as humans, we can't retain as much as we would like, especially with new information that is maybe something we haven't heard or understand or been taught or ta even talked about. So the importance, the takeaway you should be having here is that you need to understand that Having all these different fillers, all these different materials, you need to use what's called, what I call best practice. If you don't know what the material's made out of and you need to weld it, you need to try and make a determination of what it is, okay? I'll have a video coming out sometime soon on determining material that will probably help you out with that. But for right now, you need to do your due diligence to determine what the hell it is you're welding. So if you got an excavator, boom, broke in half, before you touch that with a MIG gun, you should probably know what you're dealing with. The second thing is you should really understand the welding process of what you have, what it can and can't do. So if you plan on welding three quarter inch thick plates on an excavator, boom, with a short circuit MIG, guess what, pal? You're wrong and you're gonna have a failure because of that. So you need to understand the limitations of the process you're welding with. And you need to be able to match the process you're welding with to what you're welding on. So again, that excavator boom would probably be a great job for 70, 18, 80, 18, 90, 18, something like that, or flux core wire that's rated for plate like that and not for short circuit MIG and not TIG because, well, Jesus Christ, TIG is so slow, it'd take you a month to weld an excavator boom with that. But you get what I'm saying. And us as home welders, hobbyist welders, we should be aiming to produce welds that have the highest mechanical strength within reason. On something stupid like a 
a fork pocket for a trailer to shove skid steer forks in? Do you need to weld it with 8018 rods and weld, you know, on something like, I'll give you an example. So this is in the bottom of a trailer, right? A fork pocket, there's two of them. Do you need to put a weld here, a weld here, a weld here, a weld here of 8018 or 80,000 tensile strength stick rod to on something like that? Absolutely not. That's overkill. A simple ER70 MIG weld here and here run hot enough if it's quarter inch plate is acceptable. So overbuilding something is a reality. You can do it. I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. There is a point where too much weld, too of a high strength of weld, mismatch filler, all of that becomes a detriment because if it isn't, heat input is, heat input on mild steel doesn't have too much of an effect because it isn't a heat hardenable alloy, okay? Heat input leads to other things with mild steel, which one of them is warping. You know, you run six passes on something stupid like this and by the time you're done, the forks aren't going to fit in it. So, <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? Heat input does matter. So we want to focus on getting a reasonable heat input, not excessive amount of weld, not overbuilding it, but a little bit, I, I don't want to say a little bit overbuilt, but you understand what I'm saying? A little bit better than, not the minimum, but pretty much what you should do. And for penetration wise, we should be focusing on getting something past the root of the joint and preferably a little bit more. If you're welding three quarter inch or half inch plate, you should have some depth of penetration to that. You're asking for failure without it. And that brings up a great point, and I'll draw it here. All right, sorry for the shitty picture here. We're gonna talk about that hypothetical weld again, okay? We should be aiming for some depth of fusion. So we'll demonstrate like this is a 60-10 bead, okay? 60-10 kind of looks like this, kind of like a clown nose or a dingus, whatever you call it. So this is what a common 6010 weld looks. So some reinforcements better than none, but one of the things that I didn't talk about is, you remember I talked about the root fusion to the face of the weld? Well, when you have penetration that exists past the plate, so the edge, this theoretical actual edge here, when you have penetration that exists further than that, your weld depth actually would be measured from here to the face. So by having increased penetration, you actually have a bigger weld than what you would have if you have no penetration, which on the flip side of that means that with very high penetration, you could actually, in theory, reduce your weld size that's outside of the theoretical intersection there and you would still have as strong of a weld as a weld with no penetration. So this matters on say something you had to weld with very tight confines where you really couldn't get in there very much. By getting more penetration you could undersize a weld to where maybe you had to remove less of it to make something else fit. It's something to think of. And you're not going to see too much of that as a home gamer. Like, again, we overbuild our stuff. Like, who cares if you have root fusion? We're just looking at it from this point to this point, you know, and we're measuring and, oh, okay, we're okay. So we actually have, a, in most cases, a weld far bigger than what we would need for maximum strength. Because, again, the maximum strength of a weld, putting on, like, say we did two more passes, okay? Is this stronger than a single pass? Well, not really because, okay, so it won't fail in this section now. When you bend this top plate, it's going to fail right here and right here. Okay, so an oversized weld for the material you're welding isn't really a benefit. The exception to that, because, you know, it's welding, there's always exceptions. 
when you're using brazing, it's very common to produce a braze that's far bigger than a weld. And the reason behind that is to get maximum mechanical strength out of that braze, you have to oversize it because it's weaker than welding. It works kind of like, <laughs> in a loose way, like glue. So by having more glue, we'll grab more material, which will make it stronger. So that's kind of like an exception to that. But for the most part, with your normal steels, your weld needs to be the th thickness of your plate, if that makes sense. Now, aluminum brings up a whole nother ball game of stuff, and I'll deal with that when I get to more aluminum videos in the future, because a lot of what <laughs> applies to steels and alloys of steel don't really apply to aluminum, like in fact that the welds uh, are stronger than the base material and the base material becomes weaker outside of the weld. But that's again, a whole nother ballpark. We're just talking about steel. So let's go to conclusion. Well, I hope I address this in a clear enough manner that we're all on the same page here. And I hope you find this information valuable. There may be some uh, <laughs> factual errors or things I omitted, maybe not on purpose, maybe on purpose, I don't know. So if you have any comments on this or feel I was wrong, let me know, share it. We can all learn, you know, I'm not uh, absolved of making mistakes myself. Look at the name of my channel. I think you understand that I'm used to making mistakes and I accept them. I don't like them, but they are what they are. But with that said, I hope you learned something regarding this and I hope that you can make better decisions when it comes to making stuff. And part of making good stuff is you have to understand what is good, what is bad. And if you don't understand that, then where do you know where you are? You're in a gray area. And that's, I think, why a lot of us never get past a certain point of knowledge with welding or with anything, simply because we have no reference point. And if you don't understand where you are, it's hard to understand where to go or what you should do, etc. You get the point. But I had a lot of fun making this video. I plan on doing a couple more videos much like this, this book learning type stuff to where I can get a lot of thoughts I have out so that you guys, as you watch future videos, we're all on the same page and we can really start making some cool stuff that, uh, that I will that you can as well. So anyways, thanks for sticking around. Until next time.